getting started. Okay, so again, here we are learning about equitable course design and building courses for diverse learners. Um, and again, I'm Lindsay, um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm an inclusive teaching coordinator for CIDL at NIU. Um, and today we're going to, hopefully by the end of this workshop, uh, be able to identify elements of equitable course design, understand how a course's content assessment and policies are not neutral, um, and they might not support or reflect some students' identities, experiences, and needs. And we're going to identify ways to adapt course materials for greater equity. So to start off, I want to talk a little bit about learner diversity and um, address the fact that course design is not neutral. When we show up to the class and we expect certain things from students, we aren't coming in with neutrality. Um, any sort of assumptions that we have about our course or about what makes sense, that's going to, uh, th we're starting from a place that is not neutral, okay? so. Uh, we're making assumptions about students' needs, we're making assumptions about their knowledge base, and we're making assumptions about their devotion to the topic um, and how that impacts their success in our classes. Uh, I'm sure some of us know we've had uh, students that are capable of doing the work, but they don't have enough time to do the work in order to get the grade that you know we think they should get. Um, we know some students get into our classes, they're not at all interested in the topics, they have to be there, um, and they're just trying to get by. Um, even if they really like you or they have a lot of fun in your classes, that doesn't mean that they have the, the time and the space or the interest in the topic. Um, some of our students are coming in and they don't know anything, um, especially after uh, coming back in person um, from the pandemic, the students that I was seeing in the writing classroom that didn't know uh, terminology that we previously would have thought to be basic, like asking them what is a thesis statement, and they didn't know that stuff, um, we sort of had to adapt, right, and to make sure that we um, weren't leaving those students behind. And we also make assumptions about students' needs. Um, if students have accommodations, we might be meeting those needs that are written out on a, on a sheet of paper, uh, but not everybody that needs uh, to have approval for from the DRC is able to get that. So we have students that need those, uh, that extra time or need uh, technology that can't get uh, those accommodations from the university. Um, we have students that their needs shift throughout the class, whether it's due to um, illness, due to uh, temporary disability or uh, becoming disabled, um, whether it's something going on in their personal life with uh, caretaking or um, you know, uh, disability or uh, death within their family. So students' needs are going to fluctuate and we can't assume that they're coming into the classroom without all of this other stuff. Uh, and that other stuff makes them human. So we need to, you know, embrace that. Um, but it can make it tricky when we're thinking about how do we set up classes for students that are complex human beings um, and uh, make sure that they're able to be successful. Um, and there are basic things about our identities and about our uh, human existence that make it difficult for us to learn. Um, so when we think about our uh, social identities like gender, race, ethnicity, sexuality, age, social class, 
uh, all of those things can impact the way that we learn in class, whether it's uh, something that we uh, experience that outside of class and we're bringing that uh, energy into the class, whether it's the topics that we're talking about in class, uh, whether it's the fact that we can use the restrooms in that building, all of those things um, are, are coming with us as learners and are coming with our students as learners. Um, and then there's also, you know, things like their responsibilities outside of class, uh, their linguistic background, um, ability, neurodiversity, uh, culture, uh, experiences that they're having currently or that they've had previously in education, and if they have support systems too. Um, so there's all of these things that are, are uh, really making our students um, interesting and cool and complex people, but also uh, might create barriers when they're coming into the classroom um, and might create distractions for them when they're coming into the classroom to learn. Um, so what can we do? Uh, we can't take away all these barriers. We can't take away all these distractions, but we can overtly uh, value their individuality um, we can recognize the diversity and all of the cool things that they're bringing into the classroom because they're uh, a diverse group of people. And we can acknowledge that their needs are not the same and that uh, their needs are important. And if we can meet those things, then, then we're going to try. So we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, designing a course. Uh, today, but we're going to be focusing on five main aspects of uh, course design. So we will be talking about communication, instruction, assessment, grading, and policies. Um, and all of these design elements uh, are need to be backed up with delivery too. Um, so we're not going to be talking specifically about uh, what uh, instruction might look like on the day to day in your class. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about uh, how we might intentionally set up a class for instruction to be equitable or more equitable. Some of the things that we talk about today uh, fall under universal design. Um, or UD, or you might have heard uh, Universal Design for Learning, so um, UDL. Uh, CITL offers other workshops on universal de design, and I highly recommend um, attending them. But uh, universal design is going to play into a little bit of what we're talking about. But specifically, uh, this means that you're designing course uh, the course or course content or um, thinking about course delivery with the student needs in mind. Um, and so we're thinking about flexibility with deadlines and communication and engagement. We're thinking about um, giving students options for learning, for engaging, and for being ass assessed in our classes. And we're giving them an opportunity to receive feedback from us in order for them to um, understand what, what we're asking of them and uh, what they can improve on. But it also gives them an opportunity to give us feedback and state their needs, their confusion, what we can be doing to meet their um, needs a little bit better or help them become successful in the classroom too. So um, this is really a give and take sort of um, design for classes, which also means that uh, it might take more time than the way that we might think about uh, traditional course design and traditional course del delivery where students take for exams this semester, they listen to you lecturing and um, they can only miss four classes or they're automatically failed. 
right? This is a little bit more hands-on than that approach. So it does take more time, especially when we have larger classes. Overall, I think it's worth the time that you put in, um, but it, I also want to acknowledge that it can be very overwhelming um, and exhausting, um, especially as you are starting to make those shifts. So I first want to talk a little bit about communication and connection. Um, I don't think that it is um, going to shock anybody when I say that a lot of students that I've had in the past um, are successful because they communicate with me. Um, there are certainly some students that don't have to ask for anything that can just turn in the work, don't need to attend class, and they'll be cool. Um, but a lot of students do need to have these conversations with us and need to be able to ask questions, to get clarification, um, to state their needs, to tell us what's going on in their lives. And so um, we need to make sure that we are uh, creating opportunities for that connection um, that are more equitable. So um, giving students an opportunity to meet with you virtually, not just in person, um, seems, I think, kind of basic to some people. But um, I know a lot of people are very um, intentional about how they spend their time. They want boundaries. I love a boundary. Um, but giving students an opportunity to meet with you virtually might be the difference between somebody who has uh, is working full time and um, has responsibilities as a parent and is only on campus, you know, two days a week uh, between them being able to actually have a conversation with you um, and between them not being able to make that work. Um, giving students an opportunity to meet with you physically inside your office and outside of the office. Um, obviously, if you're talking about confidential information, meeting inside the office is ideal. Uh, for some students, they're not going to visit your office because it kind of feels like being sent to the principal's office and it ties into these weird like power dynamics and possibly educational trauma. Um, which sounds silly, but, you know, like, it can be a lot. Um, also, I had an office in Zuloff for quite a while, and students didn't understand how to navigate that building and would just give up. Um, I have worked in uh, DuSable, and students don't know how to navigate that building, and they'll just give up. Um, so if you can meet with them in a space that is easier for them to navigate. Um, and the student center lets me outside of uh, Starbucks. Um, if you can meet in the building that you're teaching the classes, if there's an area that there's chairs or a bench or something, and you can have a conversation that isn't um, too personal or confidential, those are great options for students too. Um, that's also something to keep in mind too with accessibility. Um, just because a student can access your office doesn't mean it's easy for them to access your office. So uh, that's something to keep in mind as well when you're asking them to um, physically meet you somewhere. I also highly recommend creating a Q&A discussion board on um, Blackboard, but you could also use some other uh, tool, tech tool that we have. Um, through NIU that is, you know, free. Um, it gives you an opportunity to share answers to questions with everybody. So especially if those questions are asking for clarification about assignments or asking for clarification about um, what a specific policy is or um, do we have class on this day or whatever, you can share the answers with everybody. And if one student has the question, probably three others do too. So. It also cuts down on you um, having to individually talk to all of the students or having them just make mistakes because uh, they're afraid of asking you. Um, and also, this is a great way for students to ask questions anonymously so that 
they don't think that, uh, you know, like you're going to think less of them for not understanding something um, or for forgetting something from class or whatever. Um, allowing them that option can really be the difference between them asking a question and feeling um, comfortable asking questions and them just not asking questions and uh, feeling like they can't uh, reach out to you. And sometimes it's that first question that needs to be anonymous and then they're like, oh wait, this person is nice to me when they when they're responding. And so I feel comfortable like sending that email or asking questions in class or even just participating on this Q&A discussion board now, but um, I don't need to be anonymous anymore because I wasn't treated as if that was a silly thing to ask. When we're thinking about instruction um, and how we're setting up our class, we wanna make sure that we're thinking about uh, recognizing different types of learning and giving students uh, multiple options for understanding. Um, I think that it's pretty well known now that uh, learners access information differently um, and that we benefit from concept uh, reinforcement. So we talk a lot about this in K through 12, but it's true for college students too. So um, having them not only read something but write about it are we asking them to write journals or reflections or summaries are we getting them to move or touch or do something physical in class um, and we know that not everybody has uh, the range of movement or can um, can navigate classrooms very easily because of uh, mobility issues or um, disabilities but if there is something, if there's a physical aspect of that um, content that we're learning, if we're thinking about um, atoms bouncing off of one another, whatever it is, is there some sort of like visual representation that they can uh, physically see or touch or move around in class so that we're, um, we're reinforcing those concepts and we're making them less abstract? That's, it's a similar thing with uh, visual aids. If you're talking about World War I, are you showing um, pictures? Are you showing charts? Are you showing graphs? Are you showing, showing data that is reinforcing what you are talking about in class? Um, or are you uh, talking about dates and about casualties and stuff in an abstract way, um, which might be hard for students to grasp that concept because um, maybe their brains just don't like abstract numbers. Um, but also if we're showing uh, pictures along with data, um, we can really reinforce humanity and we can reinforce like this applies to something real. Um, and are we providing um, them, them the opportunity to actually hear information um, so are they listening to lectures or recordings? Um, are they having discussions in class rather than just reading information? Are we uh, reinforcing that with, with something else? And those recordings could even be a supplemental uh, video from Nat Geo or something. It does not have to necessarily be something that you created yourself, but are we giving them an option for um, having that information sink in in a couple different ways. And are we allowing them to do cooperative learning? So uh, that might be group work, it might be group discussions. It does not have to be a large group project. Uh, I think we all know that students don't like those. Um, it's good for students to have to do group projects and do group work. They need to learn how to work with others and um, not, you know, distrust other people. But if you can give them low stakes ways of uh, connecting with others and having that information, um, interacting with that with that information and uh, learning with other people, that's really useful. Um, and then also uh, this ties into to a lot of what I was saying earlier, but giving them multiple options for understanding. So 
is there a visual representation of, of what's going on? Are you giving them, um, providing PowerPoints or tables or figures or images? Um, if you are talking just about the uh, layout of an essay, are you putting that up on, um, on the projector and are you showing them what a physical essay, like the formatting looks like for MLA, for example? Um, are they actually getting that in front of them or are you talking about margins in, their, um, in an abstract way? Um, so are we linking visual representations to discussion and to lecture um, and to possibly, you know, readings in class too. Um, we can use uh, video or audio recordings, again, to uh, further understanding. It could be something that you create um, that summarizes what you talked about in class or reacts to uh, a reading that you've done. It could be a supplemental podcast. It could be a supplemental video that is available online already. Um, it could be that you have um, an adaptable reading for class that they can uh, listen to the audio of and not just read it. Um, those are all great options so that students have another um, way of, uh, of learning those concepts, of um, hearing that information, of interacting with that information. Um, it's also really useful if you can create a list of common language for the class. So if there are specific terms and definitions that um, you are going to be using in the class that are specific to the field, that are specific to um, the topics that you're covering, uh, if you can have a list of those where either students are uh, creating this list and adding to it or Maybe you have a basic uh, list that you start the semester with. That's all really useful, especially when we're thinking about uh, having students write their essays or even just uh, participate in discussion boards. We want to make sure that we have a common language and we don't assume anything about students' um, backgrounds, whether they're not whether or not they're going to know uh, what a thesis statement is. Um, but we're providing them with that information so that they can. Um, talk about a thesis statement and not struggle with that language. When we think about assessments, we want to make sure that we are creating assessments that are um, leading back to the course objectives and that the uh, learning objectives from the assessment um, are clearly tied to what we have students doing. So we're not doing busy work for the sake of doing busy work, right? We're um, being intentional about what we're asking students to do, and we can show them why it's important that they're doing that thing. Um, and we want to make sure that uh, when possible, that we're giving students options for demonstrating the knowledge and the skills that um, that you're covering in that class. So, um, yeah, Simone. So I had a question kind of thinking about this uh, busy work uh, yeah. issue, right? Because I think um, often students see things as busy work, mm -hmm. but they're really um, scaffolding attempts. Yeah. right uh by us right like you need to do the repetition of a specific skill so it becomes ingrained and that can seem like busy work but then as you progress through the semester it's really foundational and you can say that but right often it doesn't land right so yeah. I, i'm i'm thinking about you know you talked about thesis statement and so often i when when i have a class with uh say a large paper, like a 400 level class where they're expected to do a research paper, right? I have all these little things like, you know, go to Google Scholar, find five articles, annotate those five articles, right? It can seem like busy work, but mm -hmm. all those little sort of mundane tasks 
scaffolding to uh, a way to build the paper that isn't just oh and you have a 25 page paper due at the end of this at, at the semester right like it's all these small pieces yeah. but i i think where i struggle and and you know having having jeff as a colleague we've, we've had some of these discussions literally down the hall is that often students don't see it that way right and mm -hmm. so they'll they'll skip certain parts and then get very frustrated when they get to three quarters of the way through the project and they're super far behind or they think they can write a research paper in in a week or overnight right and it just doesn't work and so i i, I guess i'm asking is like how do we show students right that that what we're giving them isn't just busy work yeah no that's a great question i like 100 percent you're you're not giving busy work right if it's all working um together to uh to create this larger um project it sounds like that really is an equitable way of doing that right not asking them you know okay uh we have two weeks left write 25 pages right um so one of the ways that i uh in my writing classes that i've done that um is by having the assignment sheet for like the larger project overall and then having um the like uh assignment sheets for the smaller sections um and sort of drawing back and forth like okay this is what's going to meet this particular thing this is why i need you to collect these three resources right now and um and summarize them um and so having those things uh linked that way and like repeatedly saying this is what's going to fulfill this uh, particular part of uh, this larger assessment that we're working on um, is usually helpful. But I, I think what you're talking about too is uh, students maybe just not listening <laughs> and um, not uh, not internalizing um, that aspect of uh, this is an important part. Uh, this is an important step of that you need to complete in order to uh, fully be able to do this larger thing later. Um, but I think that uh, repeatedly just acknowledging like this is this is leading up to this bigger thing, and um, I think that sometimes it's <laughs> I what I do is a lot of repeating, and it feels pretty. Um, pretty bad for me. Um, I don't like it. I don't like sounding like a broken record and reminding them, you know, every week we're working on this thing and it's going to lead to this bigger thing. Um, but a lot of that is sort of necessary. Um, and I mean, I, I think it comes down to some of the things that I was saying earlier where uh, different students maybe aren't listening um, because they have other things going on. And so it's not uh, that information just isn't sticking with them. Um, but, but yeah, I think that that's something that I would, um, sort of like continually go back to saying, okay, this is checking off this box, um, for this larger assignment. That's why it was so important for you to do this thing. That's amazing. Let's move on to this next thing and be really, um, really clear about those connections. Um, but, I mean, it sounds like, like I said, it sounds like you're doing uh, a great job of of creating an an opportunity for students to uh, take on big projects in a way that is, you know, is more equitable and is more manageable. Um, so, but, I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just, I, no, I, I, I was just gonna sort of build on on it, like. Um, yeah. I think I think where I struggle is um, um, like I, I can totally get the repetition part and being very repetitious um, if it's a intro to sociology class and I've got mostly freshmen and sophomores. Right. Yeah. Um, but 
by the time I get to a 400 level class or a, a class that's cross listed as a grad under, you know, upper undergrad class, I, I, I struggle with that idea of being so repetitive because it, it right, these skills that hopefully we've been building on since they were freshmen should yeah. have taken hold. Right. And so, um, right. That's, that's always the difficult balancing act for me, which is, um, that, uh, I, I, I want to treat them as even more of adults than they are. Um, and, and I can get, I, right. It's, it's this, this difference between sort of hand holding and spoon feeding versus, um, providing gentle reminders. And I think that's in, in my conversations with faculty, like that's often, or with colleagues, I should say, it, that's often where I think we struggle. Um, yeah. Right. Because we don't, at, at some point, some of these skills should be developed. Um, and, and are, are we doing them a disservice if in a classroom full of seniors, we're giving, oh, and just a reminder, you know, this is due tomorrow and this mm -hmm. is due next week and this is due in two weeks and this is due in three weeks, right? That feels uh, inf infantilizing a, a little bit. Um, and, and similarly, I think there's a, another catch 22, which is, um, you know, many of us, particularly post pandemic have moved to make certain assignments ungraded um, to mm -hmm. try and decrease some of the pressure. But then I think some students interpret that as unimportant, right? Because it yeah. doesn't have a number that goes into into Blackboard. And I don't yeah. know how to balance that out either. Um, because I think it's it's much more equitable for students to not have everything be pressure filled and have a point to it. But then it mm -hmm. also feels like there are those groups of students that the only reason they do it is because there's a number attached. Yes. Yeah. So that that gets into this like um, larger conversation about college students, whether or not they are um, are ready to be self-directed learners or if they um, still need to be, you know, directed by you as they were in K through 12. Um, if they need the motivation of grades or um, grades are, aren't what they need at this point, you know, if, if it's just the knowledge is enough, um, which is one of the things about ungrading that can be, um, can be really difficult. Um, I, and I think those are good, like, those are good conversations. I don't have, um, well, I don't think that there are necessarily answers to any of those larger things, right? Um, but I, I will say that um, if we're thinking about students that are in higher level classes, we're still making assumptions about who they are and what they're coming into the class with. Um, we, just because a student is a graduate student, like we expect certain things from them, um, but a lot of graduate students are working full-time jobs and have kids might be returning students, maybe have been out of the classroom for um, 10, 15 years and need a little bit of help with uh, organization and reminders for deadlines because they've got so much going on. If we have students that are uh, that are in their final year of undergrad, we're expecting that they can manage their their workloads and stuff, but they might be taking so many classes that are at such a high level and have so many demands that it's still very hard for them to keep everything in order. Um, if you have students that are neurodiverse or even going through a mental health crisis or um, having other things going on, like it might be one of those things where they just don't remember what's going on um, once they leave the class. Uh, it might be hard for them to think about um, aspects of the course if they're not physically in that space, um, which, you know, is just, a, it's hard for students to learn how to manage, especially if something new has happened um, to them to get to that point. So I think that um, 
if you are going to be in a course where you're expecting students to to manage that stuff on their own, to remember uh, due dates and whatnot, um, I would specifically carve out time in the beginning of the semester and say, okay, these are the dates that you need to remember. Like, I'm going to give you time right now to put this in like your personal calendar or whatever. Um, and it might feel like handholding, but if you don't want to do continuous reminders, making sure that they, from the, from the jump, they are taking these things into account, I think, um, can be really, really useful. Showing them uh, particular tools that you like to use in order to organize um, your schedule and the things that are um, that are on the horizon is helpful. Um, we obviously have uh, our Outlook calendars that we can use that they can set up reminders um, for when things are due. We have uh, Microsoft Tasks, which is useful that will send you a reminder of what to do, um, but you have to take time to set that stuff up. Um, yeah, Ashley, setting the culture for for expectation. So um, being very clear from from the jump, this is what you know we need to do. Um, but uh, when you're going, when you're introducing a new assignment, when you're introducing um, a new aspect of the class, like actually setting aside time to for them to not only learn about the thing that they're going to be doing, um, but also look at their schedules, encourage them to get out their computers, get out their phones, get out their planners, um, and sort of think about it that way, I think is really, really useful too. Um, which, you know, they're managing a lot. I think um, sometimes we talk about this as like student deadlines and um, they should be treating their classes like, like it's their job, like their your job is to be a student. Um, but we have to keep in mind that if their job is to be a student, then their job is to be a student in four or five different classes. Some of them are taking, you know, um, more than that. Um, and they have competing deadlines and different things going on. Um, in addition to possibly an actual job, um, in addition to possibly, um, a sport or something that they get scholarships from, which, uh, also equates to a job in a lot of ways. So um, there's a lot of moving parts, and I don't think it's infantilizing to uh, to set up reminders and um, to be intentional about that um, within your class. But I do think that uh, if that's something that you want to make sure that they're that's a skill that they they should be learning or something that you don't want to carve time out for um, setting that expectation from from the jump. Yeah, like uh, like Ashley said, setting that expectation expectation and also showing them how to use the tools um, is really useful. And you could even create a video that's like, oh, hey, look at these things or create a, a resource list that's like, oh, hey, look at these things that we have for free through NIU. Um, which I think is is a useful way of doing that. Um, but uh, I will go back and say again, I love that you're scaffolding assignments. I love that you're breaking those things down into smaller parts because um, if we're going to have students practicing things, if it can lead to a bigger thing, um, that is useful. Um, I also, when I talk about uh, busy work and busy work from a student's perspective, it's more of um, something that we're not being, we're not able to demonstrate is useful. If you're having them take low stakes quizzes in class um, or take um, practice exams in class, if you can demonstrate to them that this is going to help them when they take um, exams that are actually worth points later, uh, that's a very useful thing. Um, but maybe sometimes it's reminding them why why you're having them do the thing that is uh, a necessary component. Um, uh, 
where am I, what am I thinking about? Okay. Uh, so I, I would love to uh, continue that conversation. And there are some um, workshops coming up about different types of grading and what that looks like in the college classroom too, um, which I think some of you might be interested in. So make sure to check out uh, those upcoming workshops. Um, because all of these things are, are tied together in this really complex way um, that's really uh, cool and complicated and can make our jobs very difficult when we're like, I just want to do this thing. Um, how do I get to do this thing? How do I get students on board to do this thing? Um, does it make sense? So um, I will say um, also, uh, thinking again about assessment, um, if we're able to think about um, the skills or the knowledge that are important for our students to demonstrate that they have, uh, can you give them options for assignments? Um, in the first year composition program, traditionally we've been told students got to write. Students got to write an essay. This is what they need to be doing for X, Y, Z things. Um, but they can still write and have it not be an essay. Uh, they can write and create a video. They could uh, create a podcast to demonstrate that they um, have an understanding and um, can analyze um, Born a Crime, which was a common read a few years ago. Um, students in um, your history class might want to create a mini lesson to demonstrate that um, that they have a, an understanding of what you've been talking about. Maybe they're creating a children's book about a particular event or a PSA that is talking about the things that led up to this event and how to avoid those things in the future. Um, if we're going to critique a piece of art, maybe we write a Yelp review instead of just an essay that's critiquing it. Um, maybe students create a YouTube video or create a series of memes that do uh, that critiquing too. Uh, is it important that we have the assessment be um, an essay because we need them to learn how to write an essay because we're saying that that's an important way of communicating? Or can we get them to communicate the ideas and demonstrate the knowledge um, in different ways that they might think are more interesting and that they're going to work hard at? Um, creating a series of memes is would 100% take me so much longer than writing an essay um, and create a lot more effort on my part. But I know that uh, for other people, that might make more sense with their brain, that might be more interesting. And even if it takes them longer, they might be happier in the end doing that instead of writing an essay. Um, and if we're gonna have students uh, reflecting on something, they can write a traditional reflection, um, but they could also create a vlog that's reflecting on something or even a, a series of social media posts. Um, students are going to, um, we're, we're in this world where, you know, vlogs are, everywhere they're normal that might be something that they have to do for the, a job in the future creating social media posts might be something that they have to do for a job in the future so it's not um wild for them to be doing these things that uh connect to their personal lives and possibly future professional lives um that they're meeting the same goals and they're demonstrating the same understanding through um that isn't just writing <clears throat> and I do want to say that essays and exams can still happen. I think that that's, uh, it's necessary in some courses, it, especially if you've got these lecture halls of 200 people and you're teaching four classes. Exams make sense in those situations, um, if for nothing else than for your brain to be happy, because otherwise that's a lot of grading and it would take up all your time, right? Um, but we want to think about what the options are for checking comprehension, 
Um, and what are we doing to help students work on those uh, pieces and to work to study between those assessments? So um, scaffolding assignments is a big one, giving press, practice exams, excuse me, or low stakes quizzes for students to practice information before we get to the big final product is uh, very helpful, gives them an understanding of what the expectations are for that big final thing. Um, it can really help with their uh, anxiety too when they're, uh, when they're working on assignments for your class. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I don't think this is a big surprise, but we need to make sure that it's clear where students are earning points and where they're being deducted and why they're being deducted. So we need to make sure that our rubrics are very clear. If we need to switch up rubrics in the middle of the semester because students are saying that it's unclear, that is okay. That is not a failing. This is a part of growth, right? We make mistakes just like they do. And we need to uh, be adaptable and to learn to do better. Um, even creating assignment sheets that you know have the grading rubrics, having the learning objectives um, is very useful. But I also recommend having a checklist, um, especially if we're having um, recruiting larger assignments. Creating a checklist of things that uh, students need to include in a portfolio, for example, or complete in order to meet all the expectations for that larger project is very useful. And this is something that, again, if you're scaffolding and you're creating smaller um, assignments along the way that uh, connect to this larger assignment, having that checklist on the larger assignment might be useful in a way to uh, reinforce the, the connection there too, and to demonstrate that this is actually we're, we're doing something with this. It's not just like me asking you to do this thing randomly. Um, and we also want to think about leniency on due dates. We cannot get rid of due dates. That's just, it doesn't work at our uh, university, right? Grades are due at a specific time. Students need to be able to know what their GPAs are in order to um, get their scholarships, in order to graduate, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, Due dates have to exist at some point, but can we be lenient with our students on those things? Can we create a period for them? Um, and a culture that doesn't shame them if they ask for extra time. Um, I am very clear with my students when grades are due to the university, and I tell them I cannot accept things after this specific day at this specific time. Um, because I have needs as a person too. And uh, I find that being very direct with them about that stuff is very, very helpful. Um, but that means that I say, okay, turn this in by 10 a.m. on Monday instead of, you know, by midnight on Sunday because I'm not going to be grading until 10 a.m. So I give them that extra time to turn things in. And I'm being um, like, open and honest with them about what my schedule looks like too. Um, and also giving students an option to revise and resubmit assignments or even retake exams, retake uh, specific or uh, redo specific uh, questions that they got wrong um, in order to demonstrate understanding and also to give them opportunity to learn from their mistakes because this is how we, we learn. Um, we're not great at the thing that we uh, are learning the first time through. Sometimes uh, students take more time to learn things and they have to get feedback. They have to know what's going on um, specifically with their work, not just with this is how you write uh, thesis statements in general. Why is this not meeting the expectations of a, a thesis statement specifically? How do we revise it to meet those expectations? Um, so giving them an opportunity to revise and resubmit or retake something, redo something is, is really useful. But again, this is a time that you have to think about also um, when it comes to grading, when it comes to things being due, are you creating grace period with that? Or, uh, and is there enough time for them to redo something? Um, if they get feedback from you, what does your grading process look like? 
Um, but I think all of these things are, are useful and are things that we can maybe tweak. Some of these things, maybe it has to be a hard no, this doesn't work um, right now for me. And I think that that's okay. But uh, being aware that students have different needs again with um, when they can turn things in. Um, okay, I can't take the exam on that day because I have surgery. What are my other options? Um, what can that look like? for students that have those specific needs that we want to make sure that we're meeting because the student has to have surgery. Um, we still want them to, to be successful in the class, right? Like that's, they can't really uh, mess around with that stuff, right? This is something that they need in their, in their personal life, but we also want to make sure that their academic life doesn't go off the rails because of that. Um, we are almost out of time, but I want to um, just quickly mention that um, policies, when we're creating policies for our classes, we also want to think about student needs. So um, are we creating environments where it is taboo to have technology when students need technology a lot of times, whether it's because they have uh, accommodations or just because it works better for their bodies, but they don't have accommodations for that. Um, do they have access to restrooms, food and drink if they need those things? Um, are we penalizing them uh, for absences or tardiness when their uh, bodies don't always work the way that they want them to, um, when they have to go to three buildings over in order to use the restroom? And are we giving them options for participation and engagement that uh, differ? whether or not they are physically in the classroom when they are in the classroom, but they have a flare up and they don't feel well. Are we still giving them options to participate um, that don't force them to uh, show up in ways that we would expect them to if they're feeling great? Okay. Um, it is 11. I want to thank you all so much for, uh, for showing up. We ran out of time, but I love running out of time because we have a conversation. Um, I will stick around, um, but I don't want to take up too much more of your uh, time because y'all got to have, you all have to have boundaries too. Oh my gosh. Uh, so thank you all for, for showing up. If you have questions, concerns, I'll be here for a few more minutes, but thanks for joining me today. I'll send out this video. Uh, in a few hours to all of you that are interested. Bye everyone, have a great rest of your day.